Hi folks, um, pleasure being here. Um, I really hope that the next 40 minutes will be really interesting for you folks. Because um, uh, it's really something I'm really proud of and I'm really happy that uh, so sort of seeing an action. And, and I think this can be a real game changer in the industry. Um, so let's get started. First of all, a little bit on who I am. Uh, well, my name is Christopher Dutz. I'm a senior software engineer at a company called Mapped. Um, and uh, I've always been uh, and still are a real open source enthusiast. So all of my free time really goes uh, into all sorts of different um, open source projects, most of them at Apache that has sort of made me a, a committer and member of a, a lot of the, the open source projects we have there. Um, I'm also the initiator and uh, currently acting vice president of the Apache PLC for X top level project. And if you want to hear what I'm sort of working on and sometimes a little sort of like just uh, distraction fun stuff, uh, just follow me on Twitter. Uh, also on LinkedIn, that's where I sort of post a bit more serious uh, and a little lengthy stuff. So um, I'd be happy uh, to see you there too. Um, so let's get started uh, with uh, this uh, talk. So let me jump over here so I don't get in the way. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about is sort of um, how was the industry in the, let's say, industry 3.0 times? Um, what's changed in the 4.0 times that we're currently living in? What are the challenges the industry is facing uh, with these uh, changes? And how the industry is currently solving these problems? Um, yeah, so they are solving the problems, but I'd say I'm not, not in a really, really great way. So um, I'm going to be talking about what I think is actually wrong with these and how we can do it better. Um, and in the last part, I'm going to be showing you or talking about how we did things better and a little outlook on what's still missing to sort of make this uh, wide scale adoptable. So, so we're talking about this sort of stuff. Uh, we're not going to be talking about these little uh, home setups where somebody has a PLC or two or, well, let's say even 10. Um, it's sort of uh, not even my demo factory uh, that some of you might have seen um, is sort of applicable for this uh, sort of thing that we're talking about. Um, so we're talking about these, these big ones there. Um, so what was in the 3.0 times? Well, in general, people say, 3.0, industry 3.0, that was the time when uh, sort of uh, PLCs entered the, the stage, um, SCADA systems came up. Um, these are usually machines uh, automated with PLCs. Uh, most of them are sort of autonomous, so they're not connected. It's sort of like just sort of the PLC is just controlling uh, the machine and maybe has a, an HMI, a little, little display where you can sort of push some buttons. Sometimes it's really just like on the old enterprise, you have these real turn knobs and big push buttons. Um, not much more. Some, the, the, the bit bigger ones, uh, they're usually connected to SCADA systems. Usually they belong to the, or, or, or are from the same vendor uh, as the PLCs because, well, that's the way uh, things worked in those times. Um, they were all proprietary and closed source software. Um, and, well, data acquisition in general was only done for, well, operation. Well, you sometimes need to get some telemetry uh, in order to know how to operate your machinery. Well, and sometimes for documentation. There are some regulatory rules. Uh, for example, uh, one, one that's particularly, um, let's say, intense uh, is the U.S. Uh, FDA regulations, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. So if you're selling anything to the U.S., well, you have to apply to uh, those uh, rules. And, um, well, if you want to sell any food and drugs uh, in the, on the U.S. market, you have to follow those. And, well, these regulations require you to sort of keep track of uh, some uh, important data and, and, and telemetry. So, in general... In these times, um, 
you can think of uh, the internet wasn't a real problem because uh, it, it wasn't really a firewall like on this picture, but they were just not connected. They, were, they weren't sometimes even connected with each other. You had separate machines uh, and they were just talking to themselves or their neighbors. Um, so security really wasn't that much of a problem. Um, but, well, this has changed because uh, with Industry 4.0, systems started or had to become interconnected. Um, more and more uh, new software was used because, well, let's face it, uh, if you want to go into machine learning, uh, in the beginning, the automation industry didn't have anything. So if you wanted to start with that, well, you had to go for uh, existing solutions, and most of those were open source. Um, uh, well, and uh, I think the, the most obvious thing is, well, if you want to get your production data into the cloud, well, you sort of have to connect your production network uh, with uh, the internet in order to get it into the cloud. Um, data acquisition, well, now it's more excessive because, well, we still need data required for operation of the machinery or for the already mentioned documentation uh, cases. But we also want to run analytics on our, our machines. Uh, how is the, the utilization of my machines? How I can I optimize that? Uh, for predictive maintenance, for machine learning, you need sort of 100 times the data amount you had when uh, you only just wanted to fill some, let's say, a spreadsheet for documentation purposes. Uh, there are a lot more use cases, and uh, it sometimes feels like every day a new use case comes up. But uh, let's face it, all of those require data, and lots of it. Mm, so, these are the challenges that we're now facing, because now our machines are connected to the internet. Uh, and while it was still possible to sort of like in the past, uh, I think all of you heard about that Stuxnet uh, situation where uh, the, where the, the Iranian nuclear um, enrichment plants were, were attacked. That wasn't a, a typical internet hack. So sort of that was an on-premise uh, thing where you really had to know the hardware. So you weren't really 100% safe in the 3.0 times. But let's face it, uh, in the 4.0 times when things are connected to the internet, well, it's a lot easier. Uh, you, you sometimes don't even have to leave your office. Um, so this is currently the threat the industry is most uh, um, scared about. Uh, it's sometimes, most of them are talking about industry espionage, but uh, in general, what they're most, probably most afraid of is that sort of some attacker uh, comes in and uh, actually breaks something. And uh, I mean, things can really go bad uh, when you're talking about uh, industry uh, machinery. Um, and why is this a problem? Well, let's say the OT departments um, are totally new to these outside challenges. Um, and OT uh, means uh, operational technology. And it's sort of like the equivalent of, uh, well, in the, the, the classical IT, we have the IT department. They do all the networking, installing stuff, maintenance of software. Well, and the OT guys are the ones taking care of the um, industrial uh, automation networks, uh, the PLCs and, and stuff like that. Um, and, well, because they're new to these outside ch uh, outside challenges. Well, let's say the administration is sort of a bit naive um, because they can only protect against things they know about. Um, and let's say uh, a few examples of uh, where this is prob problematic. For example, um, a lot of automation systems are accessible from the internet. Uh, it's probably not that they wanted to do it that way. Um, on the next slide, I'll show you a little uh, numbers on that uh, or, or an impressive map. Uh, sometimes the automation industry came up with password protection that just doesn't work. Uh, my, my favorite um, example is um, Siemens S7 devices. They have this little thing where you can sort of flick uh, or, or a check uh, a checkbox uh, in your uh, TIA automation um, engineering software. And then it's know-how protected. Well, the thing is, uh, you need a password in order to sort of read out the, the, the software or, or change it. 
But the strange thing is, well, the way they implemented the password protection was it's sort of like um, the, the engineering software connects to the PLC, uh, checks in the PLC if there's a little flag set. If it's set, well, they ask for a password. And then they compare the hash with a, a, a hash stored uh, in the PLC. And only if that matches, uh, they continue to work. Well, this is a great protection as long as you're using, actually using the uh, TIA portal uh, engineering software. But if you're sort of like just reading out stuff, well, there is no protection at all. And uh, another thing, uh, if you enable uh, the OPC UA stack on these machines, well, you can turn on authentication. Then you need a username and password in order to connect to that via OPC UA. But, yeah, you know, well, uh, if you don't have the password, well, just fall back to S7. That doesn't have the that mechanism and you can access the machine the same way. Um, in other cases I've seen um, password protection where the password is transmitted in clear text. It's not even encrypted. So um, one, one case I've seen here was the, the Beckhoff ADS uh, protocol. They have a sort of, well it's sort of not the ADS protocol, it's sort of the tooling around it. And we've seen uh, that if you use the engineering software and you say oh, please uh, set up a, a, an AMS route. Uh, well, it uses some undocumented protocol. Well, and uh, you can see admin usernames and passwords uh, transmitted in clear text. So uh, that's one of the reasons we're not going to be supporting that because actually using it is really dangerous. Um, so the only real secure option for protection is simply not to connect. And I promised you uh, the thing with accessible from the internet. Well, I just had a look just a few, two days ago, and um, here's the, I'm using a, a search engine called Shodan. Uh, it's sort of like a search engine for open ports on the internet, and you can get some little more information on it. I have never in my life connected to any of the devices uh, listed there, and I strongly suggest none of nobody of you does that either, because uh, first of all, there's a legal risk. Well, you could be sued, um, but I think the most problematic thing is uh, the risk for the lives of people. And um, I'm, I'm not just talking about, well, there is this one, one machine that breaks. There are sometimes even oil tankers whose control systems uh, can be accessible uh, without any protection. Um, a good friend of mine uh, has a lot of uh, these uh, dangers with uh, IoT uh, things uh, here in Germany. Um, so, um, I really strongly suggest you not do that. But I think I still like this uh, tool because it shows me that, for example, this is a search. Um, I did it intentionally with Modbus, as I know that, especially in Asia, Modbus is sort of like um, a pretty dominant protocol. And each of these red dots, uh, well, uh, are, oh, are industrial machinery with open uh, Modbus uh, connectivity that are freely available on the internet. And as Modbus doesn't have any means of protection, well, I think there's a lot of danger you could do uh, or damage you could do there. Um, some numbers. Um, in total, well, let's say um, the US seems to be leading with this, but 55,000 machines available on the internet, that's a lot. As I mentioned, they could be coffee machines. But they could also be something like this. Um, and this is probably uh, sort of, if you think, well, messing around with a power plant, and this is intentionally not a nuclear one. I hope it's not a nuclear. I, I hoped it was a, a coal one. Um, because uh, I think you can imagine a lot of things can happen there. But I've seen the industry actually not being that terrified uh, in those uh, sections. The parts where it really gets sort of the danger zone is uh, sort of the parts where you're really uh, getting into trouble if you've got uh, issues like this as, uh, well, let's say something like this. Uh, and uh, I chose this uh, image not because uh, sort of uh, I'm German uh, and I, I just sort of love beer, um, but it's uh, because it's uh, sort of food, it's a food and production, uh, food and drug production line. Um, and as I mentioned, the FDA regulation usually is a lot stricter than uh, everything that is sort of non-nuclear food and drugs. Um, for example, without hesitations, uh, customers let me sort of connect to 
all of the PLCs of a production line of one of the major German car manufacturer production lines. There, there were no issues with me connecting with those machines. Um, but when it came to sort of like a pharmaceutical, uh, a chemical, or um, food and drugs, uh, well, uh, then I was only allowed to sort of like connect to um, uh, demonstration machinery. Um, yeah, so how does the um, industry currently solve these problems? Well, I think you could sum it up. Uh, it all comes down to sort of like they just invest a lot of money. They, it seems like they're just taking a huge pile of money and throwing it at the problem. Um, at least it feels this way. Um, and I have to admit, one money bag is just not enough. And it actually sort of feels more like this. This is just totally silly, the prices I've seen in the industry. Let's, if I just sort of like have a look at the licenses uh, I've paid for in, in, in the, the last year, well, let's say if I take the, the JetBrains All Products pack, uh, well, I'm, I'm sort of at 650 euros or something like that. Well, if you're a long-time customer like I am, it's probably a lot less, but uh, let's just uh, assume 650 euro. Well, that's okay. Uh, if you go for a Siemens TIA Portal professional engineering license for programming S7 devices and uh, other Siemens uh, devices, well, you're already at 3,500 euros or something like that. That's still not that bad. Uh, well, even, well, if you got to update, um, well, there was recently a sort of a, a security vulnerability and, well, Siemens told uh, everybody to update their devices. Um, well, it uh, turns out the ones I have are vulnerable too. And uh, in order to update them, well, I have to get a Siemens um, SD card. It has to be Siemens formatted. Otherwise, well, they say it doesn't work. I had a look, uh, there's a 32 gigabyte SD card available for $1,000, uh, 1,000 euros. Uh, have to, I couldn't resist uh, uh, naming this because I just thought it was ridiculous. But it's still not really crazy. Really crazy, it comes to uh, cases where you um, have to use validated software, audited and uh, validated software for data acquisition. Because when it comes to this, to this I've seen license costs of around 100,000 euros per year to just get 10,000 data points out of uh, some uh, production line. And uh, when we're talking machine learning, well, you're at da uh, 10,000 data points pretty, pretty fast. Um, so how does the current, or let's say, how does one of the solutions I've, I've uh, actually seen uh, look like? Well, it's sort of like this. You've got a chain of systems, uh, you can see uh, at the beginning you have sort of the PLCs. They communicate with a SCADA system. This is sort of like the basic uh, things. Usually these SCADA systems have internal databases. So in this case, they had to sort of export the, the, the data uh, into an MSSQL server database because that was, well, the only supported one. Then they had some sort of SAP system that took data from the, SA, uh, from the SQL server and did some SAP number crunching stuff with it, ah, well, and then pumped it to an Oracle database. Um, this was all still in the secure production uh, network. Uh, so if they wanted to get data out, well, they had to buy this 100,000 and more uh, euros uh, expensive uh, software which was validated and audited software that was able to access this data uh, in the secure network. And um, when it comes to this uh, validated and audited uh, software, uh, it's sort of like you, the, 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 um, the company or uh, the, the company has to sort of hire a professional to explicitly verify each line of code you have uh, in, in, your, in your product um, in order to certify that it has no side effects and that it's not possible to access um, or to do any damage. And this is the main reason why it's so, why it's so insanely expensive. This validation audit, uh, it's just, it takes so much time, it's so much effort, and it's, yeah, well, it's, it's just insane. Uh, and on the outside, as soon as uh, there was data uh, on the outside, they were storing it in some historian. Um, and that you can just think of some really, really, really old 
SQL database. All in all, it sort of like just feels like sort of chaining stuff uh, uh, together uh, and sort of like, yeah, it's just not a pretty solution. Um, but, well, some companies sort of didn't want to do that. And so, so I've even seen uh, this as a solution. So they uh, use bicycle messengers to give hard drives a ride through the company um, uh, location. Um, they did that because it was a lot cheaper. They didn't have any problems getting budget for a bike uh, and somebody to ride the bike. Um, and uh, you would be really amazed how many companies actually have these bike messengers riding around with uh, hard drives in them. Uh, yeah, uh, this I found uh, after sort of one of our mapped uh, lock picking community events. And I noticed, oh gee, sometimes it's really easier to uh, pick uh, an industrial protocol than it is to pick a lock. So I just, just out of fun, I, I googled, sorry, is there sort of a physical lock for network devices? Uh, yeah, well, and uh, Siemens already has a solution for that. Um, so I also could resist uh, showing you this one because uh, I actually think uh, sometimes this is actually one of the really good solutions. Mm. So, uh, all in all, you can say, well, there is no open source involved in the current solutions to these problems because it's not validated software. Validation, as I said, it would require validation of the code. But in our case, or in case of open source, well, we would also have to validate all of the dependencies of, these, of the project. And I think everyone uh, who's ever built a sort of a, ma a typical Maven built open source project, well, it's more than just one library you're pulling in. And validating all of these would just be insanely expensive. It would take an enormous amount of time uh, and it would completely kill the drive of an open source project because we would be going down from weeks of release cycles to years. Uh, and uh, despite nobody really wanting to pay for that, uh, well, um, we needed to come up with a different solution. And uh, being faced with this sort of like um, knockout criteria of, well, is your software validated? And I always had to say, well, no. Uh, and then usually I was out of the race. Um, I had to come up with a new solution. Um, so what in general do I think is wrong with these? Well, first of all, I think the data flow through several systems, well, it adds a lot of light latency. Um, as soon as there are a lot more parts in the picture, uh, there is a much higher risk of system outages. There is a much higher risk of conversion errors because every time sort of maybe there is some data correction, some mapping uh, done, um, it's sort of like the, the data coming out at the end of the pipeline, it's not guaranteed to be identical to the one that came in. Uh, data corruptions, well, maybe maybe some of the solutions in between just isn't doing, uh, doing its job correctly. Um, and, well, complexity kills innovation because uh, in this one case, um, the company had the problem that they had data scientists and they wanted to work on data because, well, that's what data scientists sort of do. Um, so every time they wanted a new bit of data, uh, they, four or five systems had to be adjusted. Um, and also, well, let's say the, the expenses kill innovation. If you, if you want to sort of optimize your production to sort of be, uh, sort of save you 50,000 euros in production costs each year, well, if you have to pay 100,000 euros of license costs, well, well, it just doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't sum up. And, well, in the end, it still doesn't guarantee safety. Um, because now you might be thinking, oh, well, but every line of code has been validated and audited. How can this not be safe? Well, uh, I think all of you have heard in the last few years these um, uh, exploits like Meltdown and Spectre. Um, well, the thing is, even if those might not directly be sort of a good vector for attacking uh, such uh, validated software, uh, but in general, uh, what I want to point out is that sort of if you sort of get to compromise the hardware or the, 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 the processors your software is running on, it's just no good to sort of 
rely on uh, being validated and audited because, well, maybe you can just change what's happening underneath. And for example, Meltdown Inspector, um, all Intel processors were vulnerable uh, that were produced in the last 20 years. <coughs> so, how can we do it better? And uh, well, uh, in the background, you can see uh, our project mascot Toddy and his new best friend, uh, Gopher, uh, sitting in my little demo factory that I built last year. Um, so, how can we do things better with Apache PLC for X? Well, um, well, I'd say we need more, more open source in the industry. Um, and the thing I tried with uh, what I'm going to be talking about is a sort of giant, like not concentrating on how everybody did things before, but to more concentrate on their desired outcome. So the desired outcome is, well, we want to get data out. And we don't want to open a door for getting in. So, and the solution uh, we came up with in the end were passive mode drivers. What is a passive mode driver? Well, uh, first of all, all traffic is forwarded uh, to a listening agent. Uh, this passive mode driver running on the agent uh, intercepts all requests, response messages, subscription requests, and event messages. And it sort of like just figures out, well, here's a request with a given ID, and here's a response. Well, they seem to belong together. So this is probably going to be the question, and this is going to be the answer for it. So we, we're able to sort of like uh, have the same information that is available as if uh, it was asked uh, directly. Um, and the tricky part is sort of like joining those together. With re requests and responses, well, it's not too difficult because, well, it's sort of like, in most protocols, in the request, you describe what you want, and in the response, uh, uh, you just have to decode it. But uh, when it comes to subscriptions, it's a bit more difficult, because you have to sort of like intercept the subscription that might be happening quite a lot, uh, quite some time before an event comes in. So you have to keep track of all the subscriptions, uh, and these might even change over time. So you have to keep track of that. And... Um, sort of in order to know how to interpret the responses. Um, you can also sort of on these, um, you don't have to forward all of the traffic because that sometimes can be quite excessive. Um, you can also just sort of like filter uh, certain protocols or, or certain ports or just certain ho hosts. Um, but all in all, well, that's the, the, the general picture. Um, but how do these ensure we're actually safe? Um, well, first of all, a passive mode driver, it doesn't ask any questions. So if there is a passive mode driver in there or not, uh, there is absolutely no difference to the PLC or the, the, the control system because there is just no information coming out from the inside. With uh, regular active drivers, well, even if you think, uh, even with read requests, it's pretty easy to uh, completely shut down a PLC by just asking it too many questions. And passive mode drivers don't ask questions, they just listen, so they, they, it's just impossible to uh, interfere. But how can we ensure things are safe uh, on a hardware level? Well, what we usually do is we use a managed switch with a monitoring port that's just configured to not allow incoming traffic. Uh, for a lot of cases, this might be sort of okay. But uh, some people still don't trust uh, sort of uh, vendors of uh, network hardware. So what we can do is we can add one layer. Uh, and that's one, one thing uh, I call a data diode. Um, and I'm going to be talking about that in a few slides. Um, but all of this makes it really hard to interfere with the network. It doesn't make it impossible because in that one particular case where we wanted to use it, that still wasn't enough. Because uh, even if technically the, the, the firmware of the device was perfect, you couldn't sort of prevent somebody from just putting high voltage on this uh, Cat5 cable and just uh, frying everything in the production network. So um, if you just add an optical link, well, that's another problem you can sort of uh, take out of the equation. And with a sort of a data diode combined with an optical link, I think it's really almost impossible to sort of interfere from the outside. 
And the good thing is, as your software isn't sort of like asking any questions and it is guaranteed to sort of not have any interference with the, with the inside network, well, there's no real need to validate the software. The system is what, what we call secure by design. And uh, the, the good thing is it's also insanely fast. And more on that on uh, the showcase uh, I'm going to be talking about later. Uh, and one thing, um, if you imagine still, uh, let's say if we're using the data diode, um, still you have to sort of trust uh, this, but validating hardware is a lot easier than validating the, 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 the program for a software. Uh, so if you want to validate the, the, the circuitry and the firmware of that data, di data diode, it's a lot less code. It's a lot easier. It's a m more general purpose. So it's, it's, it's a lot cheaper and it's a lot more secure. So this is a, sort of the big picture of what we came up with. So in the end, we have uh, the PLCs talking to the SCADA system just like they were unchanged. Uh, we configured the monitoring port. Uh, attached data diode, and on the outside we had a, sort of a, a Raspberry Pi uh, running um, running a plc for x passive mode driver. And this was just uh, happily intercepting uh, the, the data in the data center and passing along the decoded information and we were uh, and we'll store it in an IoT database. Um, so now you may say, uh, well, in the beginning I said not every system has a SCADA system. Sometimes they are just sort of like maybe just connected and the PLCs are talking to each other or sometimes they're not connected at all. Well, that's also not really huge uh, of a problem uh, because uh, in this case, for example, we just add a, a, a switch with a monitoring port if they weren't connected at all and it's really easy to sort of like just have some some a simple application that's running in the secure network that's just pulling the information that we want to make available outside. This doesn't have to be sort of it doesn't have to be a SCADA system. Uh, you could use Apache PLC for X for this um, if you sort of worried that because that's not certified and this would actually be communicating with the industrial hardware where there are a lot of uh, commercial solutions that are have a a lot lower price tag than the origi original uh, solution to sort of like just pull some data. Um, as I promised, um, the data diode, here's a little picture of uh, one of the devices. Uh, this is sort of like, this is a device that was explicitly built for Apache plc for x um, It was uh, built by a company called Wiesemann and Theis uh, in Germany. Um, I added the the web URL here if you're interested, and the product name is a fixed defined firewall. And here we're talking at a unit price of 530 euros per unit. Um, and this device was explicitly the result of a talk I gave at a meetup. Uh, and after that, the CEO of uh, Wiesemann & Theis uh, approached me and we had a really interesting chat. Um, and after this chat, well, uh, I was really amazed that Two weeks, uh, one week later, I got contacted by their development engineers. Um, yeah, and I think two months later, uh, I got the first device. Uh, and what this thing does, it's sort of like, it, you, you link it between um, uh, the, the uplink port and an external device. And it sort of acknowledges the Ethernet frames on both sides. So they appear to be live connections. But what it does, it just forwards packets from the secure network to the insecure network and drops everything from the insecure network into the secure network. It's as simple as it can get. Um, and I guess uh, they can even be made a lot cheaper uh, if more are sold. And uh, they're currently not validated hardware, but they promised if uh, the numbers of uh, sales go up uh, some more, uh, that uh, this will be the next thing they will be aiming for, sort of certifying uh, that this is uh, sort of validating the software. So, as I mentioned, we did a little showcase, uh, and uh, I'm unfortunately not allowed to disclose who it was, what we actually did, in, or what the machinery did in detail, but I, I was allowed to sort of like talk about sort of the general problem and the general solution. So, 
pharma production. Uh, as I mentioned, FDA rules apply, and this makes it very challenging. Um, so the company had uh, wanted to sort of like um, have data scientists optimize the production to have better quality, less uh, um, sort of machine on, machine outages, uh, sort of less um, not correct production. Um, but unfortunately, everything they wanted to do would have completely been not eaten up by the license cost. They were using a Delta V SCADA system. Um, and um, as I said, this sort of like chain of four to five uh, systems, um, adding a new data point and adjusting five to six systems uh, or four to five systems, it was sort of a huge configuration overhead. So the objective was getting out data cheaper, getting it out securely, so we didn't want to open any doors, getting out data fast, because this chain of pumping data from one end to the other, it, it sort of, we're not talking about real time now anymore, sort of like, well, you can view the, the, the data of a few hours ago, um, but real time, completely out of the question. And it should be, uh, we want to get out data re reliably. Um, yeah. So what we came up with, well, I sat there for two weeks uh, with a training setup, and I reversed a uh, sort of a driver for the Delta V system that was able to sort of like run in a passive mode. Uh, we put that code on a Raspberry Pi, connected that to the ma management port, or to the monitoring part of an industrial switch. And all of the data that sort of like came out of that was pumped into a timescale DB. Uh, probably today I would have used uh, Apache IoT DB, but well, when we, when we did that proof of concept, well, IoT DB uh, didn't yet exist at Apache, so I didn't have it on my radar. Um, in the end, we just slammed a Grafana dashboard on top of that. Um, yeah, and this complete solution, sort of like, you just plugged it in, and there was no configuration at all, so nothing was happening. Everything that uh, the, the software did was just observe what was happening, and it was completely configuring it itself. Um, I was the first to sort of actually seem to be, or, or I, I think I was the first person uh, to sort of like be able to reverse engineer the Delta DV protocol because I think I have been contacted about this by so many people off list uh, so there is definitely some interest in this. The load on the Raspberry it was almost non-existent so it was sort of like just doing regular Raspberry maintenance stuff. Um, the load on the monitoring system as I said uh, it, it just there was no additional load on the system because, well, if you don't ask questions, you don't cause work. Um, and one of the fun things was that actually when we changed uh, sort of the, the, the machinery, uh, the telemetry updated in the Grafana dashboard almost instantly, uh, while the official SCADA system, it took it two or three seconds to sort of like update. And all of this in total, because we didn't use the data diode in that case, um, it was just 70 euro for a Raspberry Pi with a nice little metal case. So um, that was a sort of a full success. Um, unfortunately, uh, still sort of like, that's when you start getting into politics. And uh, well, let's say politics killed that project. But unfortunately, what I have to say is all of the passive mode drivers we have, and those are currently sort of like Delta V and Bucknet IP, uh, are only sort of in a proof of concept state. Um, and uh, those are because companies financed work on that because uh, they had an immediate need on having problems solved. So companies invested uh, money and uh, we came up with these drivers and they are part of the open source project. But as I mentioned, they're in a proof of concept state and sort of like it needs a little bit of um, messing around with things to get them working. Um, so we need you. Uh, and uh, you, um, I'd say, uh, is uh, two parts. First of all, we need companies because implementing these drivers is work. It's a lot of work because you have to do a lot of guessing. You have to do a lot of analysis of uh, um, communication patterns. Um, and um, it especially requires a setup that usual open source enthusiasts just don't have. Um, because in this case, you usually have a, PLC, a set of PLCs that are talking with the SCADA system, and I know nobody 
who privately owns a SCADA system to sort of run his house or something like that. Um, covering the costs currently, is it's, it's just not possible at the moment. Um, I was uh, thinking of uh, just going full uh, self-employment um, in 2020. Uh, but it turns out sort of it's just not possible to sort of like survive as a freelancer just focusing on uh, let's say plc for x related uh, development it's just not possible um, even sort of I, I got into a little of trouble with uh, the german tax offices because uh, let's say they, they just don't like if companies sort of like um, systematically operate at, at a deficit because I, I i was sort of like every euro i was sort of like earning i was just buying stuff, buying licenses, buying hardware. Um, so um, working on these passive mode drivers, it makes things even worse. Uh, so um, we need help here. Uh, the industry can save hundred thousands up to millions. Uh, I don't really care if it's dollars, or euros or whatever currency, it's just a lot of them that can be saved. And it's generally mostly the industry that would benefit from the existence of these drivers. So I think it would be a really great thing if the industry would help finance uh, development. If you're interested in that, um, just join the, the, the Apache plc for mailing list and sort of like ask for help. There are a lot of people that would be willing to work on this. Uh, the community, well, you can always, we, we always need people to uh, help coding. We need people to help testing things. Sometimes you don't even have to code. You just take our code, run it against your machinery, and, uh, well, and provide feedback on how it works. Sometimes we got things wrong. So it's really helpful if you get insights in where you got things wrong. Um, just talking about, if, if you hear somebody else sort of having a problem that plc for x could solve, well, just speak about it. Tell them what we're doing. Um, get in contact, contact with us, as I mentioned. Just uh, send an email to, to whoop, the mailing list. Um, subscribing, um, just uh, send an email to devsubscribe at uh, plc4x.apache.org or follow us on Twitter. We've got the um, Apache plc 4 uh, Twitter account where we post interesting stuff um, about the project. So, where can you get more information? Well, Lucas already had a talk uh, on plc 4 for CAN. Uh, you can uh, see the recording. That's probably going to be available later on. Uh, I'm going to have uh, four more talks uh, in the next uh, few months. One's going to be at ApacheCon on uh, Polyglot Apache plc 4 sort of how we bring plc 4 to Java, C, Go, maybe Python, .NET, stuff like that. Um, on the Linux Foundation OSS Summit, I'll be talking about embedded drivers uh, for uh, industrial communication uh, with uh, code generation. So how we're using code generation to build embedded drivers. Uh, there's a German IoT conference where I'll be talking about how to retrofit legacy production systems with uh, plc 4 x And the last one so far uh, this year uh, is going to be uh, high performance ingestion of uh, industrial production data at uh, the uh, Eclipse Con this year. So this is the first time I'm going to be having this hat trick of being speaking at all three big major foundations, but looking forward to it. And would be super happy on seeing some of you um, at one of those. So thank you for listening. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope it was interesting for you. And if you have any questions, well, don't ask me because I'm going to be, uh, well, this is just a recording, but uh, I'm going to be also uh, sitting uh, in the chat uh, and probably going to go on stage uh, after the, the talk to answer your questions. So don't hesitate. I don't bite. Um, and yeah, looking forward to interacting with you. Bye.